Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Search Podcast. So, um, today I'd like to talk about something a little bit more um, unique, I think. It's one of those things that, that I ponder personally and keeps me up at night, but I think that many people don't really uh, concentrate on it that much. I, I do see them turning queasy with it, but... I don't think that they actually take the time to, to try and understand it. And it's it's um, sort of the thought process behind imaging and a partial responder. And if, if the intent of the imaging should have or can potentially have the utility as an early alarm system to predict whether or not these patients will continue to respond and whether we should possibly operate on them or intervene with radiological means early. And so uh, the objectives today are to talk about, in a very similar fashion to, to everything else that we talk about on this podcast, uh, the general or the guiding principles and concepts. And, you know, let's start at the start. So unstable patient, uh, provided that they're not uh, penetrating trauma that could require urgent surgery or a mangled extremity or a non-survivable head injury, if they're a blunt trauma patient who comes in hemodynamically unstable, with uh, multiple areas of injury, uh, you perform your ATLS like you usually do, and eventually they are either a non-responder or a responder, if you look at the textbook, and sometimes a partial responder. Now, with a non-responder, you tend to act early. You operate, you do um, chest tubes, you do your whole nine yards, you take them to the OR, you might embolize them instead, you're wrapping pelvises, you're putting in X fixes, preperitoneal packing. You're doing everything that you can do. With a responder, you're making decisions that will eventually lead you to a diagnosis and hopefully a disposition for the patient. In the partial responder, you know that this person is either going to be going down the diagnostic spectrum where they're going to be diagnosed and, and have a disposition, or they're going to be going the non-responder route and you're going to possibly or probably uh, end up invoking the damage control resuscitation algorithm and end up doing damage control surgery of some sort you know or, or an urgent surgery of some sort probably or an urgent intervention of some sort my question comes from the, or, or the guiding principle for today's talk is can we or should we try and use imaging to steer us in that direction and allow us to either act like this patient's a non-responder earlier, saving us a whole amount of blood, uh, possibly with a mortality benefit, and kind of tell us when we can just wait and see. You know, and, and you know, it, it would be a very similar ethos to, to what we would use when we're talking about patients in general, but or stable patients in general. But the key difference here is when I have a grade three spleen that's stable and continues to be stable and walked in stable, and I'm surprised that it's an actual grade three, and there's a hemoglobin drop, but not a hemodynamic or a lactate drop, my sense of worry is less. My threshold to operate by default because of the biases that we all have as human beings is probably pretty low. When I have a uh, grade 3 spleen that comes in tachycardic hypotensive with evidence of hemoperitoneum in the abdomen, a positive fast, and a lactate that's about, say, 3.5, so it's not that high, but it, it makes you wonder, and they've responded, but they're a little bit tachycardic, it's very easy to make that decision to go to CT and figure out what's wrong. But what if I told you it was a hypotensive tachycardic fast positive response whenever you're hanging up the blood. The minute that blood stops, they drop their pressure again. Or 20 minutes after that blood stops while you're waiting for the ice stat to run, the pressure starts to trickle down. Pressure is still above 90. Your systolic is still above 100 even. Your shock index is not that bad. They're not that tachycardic anymore, but they're getting progressively worse as you stop their blood products. You know, that person you may not want to take to CT but you may also want to take the CT. Now let's make it into somebody who's fast negative with that same situation, right? Fast negative, but they're requiring lots of blood. 
their chest is a bit too easy for you, feels like there's a lung contusion situation going on. You put in two chest tubes, there's not that much blood from it. Whenever you stop giving blood, patient's blood pressure trickles down. It's, it's not quite low, but it's trickling down. It's not that bad, but it gives you a sense of badness. The heart rate's starting to pick up. The patient's well sedated, right? And so in those patients, you need to, need to make a decision whether to intervene or not. And whether it's even safe to take them to CT or not. And I would say that if you can't figure out where they're bleeding from, imaging is the only way that you can do it. And you have the luxury or a window to take them there, do it. Don't do it on vasopressors. Don't, don't start levofed fed on somebody with a systolic of 60 just to get the CT first and decide whether or not you're going to operate on the abdomen. But do it for those patients who come in with a systolic of 90, heart rate of 120, are responding to the blood products that you're giving them, their blood pressure is picking up, their heart rate's picking up, their urine output was always good from the start. And you're just wondering how this is going to go from here. Do it for the patients where the blood gas is a bit off, but the patients seem more dynamically stable and you have a window to image them. Now, when I say unstable, unstable is a relative term if you're seeing a lot of trauma. You know that the ATLS clearly states it. But real life doesn't care what ATLS clearly states. Real life will still give you gray zones. And so that's why I think that you should take things into context. And you should think about what's best for the patient, ultimately, in your setting. In terms of imaging, so in my humble opinion, uh, my FAST will tell me where they're bleeding from, which compartment, if it's clinically significant enough to be a bleed that's there. Sometimes it'll just show me a little bit of fluid, but the patient's tanking. And so I can't really blame that bleeding in the abdomen for what's happening to the patient, right? Sometimes the chest x-ray will be a clue with a massive lung contusion or an aortic knob that's not quite right. Pelvic x-rays will always help you um, whenever you can get them. I have not gotten them recently for stable patients, but I do get them for unstable patients. And the CT scan in that patient who's a polytrauma, where you're thinking in this manner, who's a partial responder, should almost always be a pan scan if not then a ct chest abdomen at least and you know it's the same general principles because you're trying to figure out whether you can act like it's a complete responder disposition diagnosis get other specialties involved or act like it's a dying patient who you caught early enough and is now going to deteriorate and requires intervention early so your FAST and your X-rays will tell you about any hemoperitoneum that's clinically significant, any pneumothoraxes that are obviously there. Blunt cardiac injury, especially if you have a pericardial fluid positive, and you also have that thing going on. Chest X-ray will show you if there's a hemo anywhere, and there's also the pelvic fracture. It also tells you what you should act on before you possibly leave for the CT scan, and I think that that's important too. And it kind of tells you where there's a potential for disaster. So if you have a little bit of fluid in the pelvis and your patient's kind of normal tensive, but their lactate's a bit off and they suddenly crash while you're getting the CT brain, you know that there's bleeding in the belly. So you know to just get the CT brain, rule out any brain injury and ship them straight to the OR because they're hypotensive now and fast positive. CT scans are mainly there to diagnose. They're also there to explain the hypotension. But if you're really good at reading the context of the CT, they can also be useful for predicting failure. Now, when I say predict failure, what I really mean is not just failure of non-operative management, but failure to recognize that partial instability is steering towards that intervention. One of the things is positive contrast brush. So uh, people keep talking about the limitations and that CT angio have too many false positives, quote unquote, and not enough false negatives. When you look at the fine print on these studies, yes, they couldn't find an area of extravasation, but they still did transarterial embolization in these cases, and the patients required less blood, blood products overall and had similar survival rates. So you're saving on blood by embolizing these patients early when you see a contrast target. This is particularly true if you have a pelvic fracture involved or you have hemoperitoneum with or without a solid organ injury. So hemoperitoneum without a solid organ injury Small bowel injury until proven otherwise. Hemoperitoneum, where there's a quantifiable amount and the amount of hemoperitoneum, and there are algorithms to calculate this, but the amount of hemoperitoneum, where there's a quantifiable amount, and hemoperitoneum with solid organ injury, 
has been recognized both in the radiology and in the trauma literature as being clinically significant for failure of non-operative management of solid organ injuries. And in addition to that, intention to treat with operative and interventional radiology, as well as increased use of blood products. And this makes sense, right? So this tells me that this patient might need some work, more work than your typical grade three without it. Similarly, when you look at the retroperitoneum, there have been various studies that have developed scoring systems specifically looking at how much blood you should give a patient before you intervene. And what seems to be clear is whenever you have a constellation of uh, fractures that leads to presacral bleeding, periortic bleeding, and bleeding that extends to the left and the right pericolic uh, spaces, it's, it's a bit more than you would like. And it's associated with higher rates of uh, transfusion practices and uh, is associated with higher rates of an intention to treat with embolization. There's also been deep learning AI algorithms that tend to quantify it as well. And they kind of give you a prognostic uh, factor. As you can see, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, as a rule of thumb in our practice, what I tend to say is, if you have a hematoma that's extending to proximal zone 2 or is extending up the, to the um, above the aisle of the sacrum or is extending to the preperitoneal space, you might be better off intervening early. Now, other things that you can look at are house field units. So house field units is how radio opaque something is uh, on a CT scan. What you do is you, that circle tool, you do the circle thing and it gives you a score for the average in the circle thing and that's the house field units. So, a very cool study, in my opinion, uh, published very recently out of Japan. What they looked at was um, when you do a contrast-enhanced CT scan of the chest and the abdomen, they looked at all the major vessels, and they found that the descending aorta and the house field units, so how much contrast is concentrated in the descending aorta and how radio-opaque it is, directly correlates with the need for massive transfusion. And I think that that's absolutely astounding and absolutely brilliant because it, it, it makes sense because of the fact that if your patient's hemoconcentrating, they're going to have more contrast in the actual artery itself. And so these are the circles that you tend to put on. They looked at various different vessels and they found the descending aorta to be the most predictive. And the difference is about 410 versus 260. So to give you an idea, barium's up there in the 700s if you give a barium meal. Your typical contrast is usually around about the 200-ish, 260-ish when you give the smart prep the first dose in the artery on phase. And uh, the uh, anything that's about the thousands is, about, is metal usually, and anything that's in the 800s to 1,000 is usually bone. Okay, just to give you a vague idea. So 410 is sort of between uh, barium and, and uh, regular um, soluble contrast, uh, IV contrast that we'd give. So it, it's sort of between the two. And it seems to be anything of 410 or above is fairly clinically significant for the need for massive transfusion. And it seems to correlate with the RTS score. Similarly with inferior vena cava volume, how collapsible the inferior vena cava is, when they did a volumetric analysis of the uh, perihepatic inferior vena cava. You'll notice that a lot of these correlate with ultrasound findings too. They also found that an inferior vena cava volume of a certain amount, which is about 15, is an independent predictor of the need for massive transfusion. Now, this was only validated for uh, blunt trauma, not for penetrating trauma. But, you know, it goes to show that it's, it is a fairly good independent predictor. There's a thousand things that are wrong about these studies, but they're leaning you towards the right direction, and they're good food for thought for how you can use CT scans for that partial responder category. So a partial responder with the IVC that's on the right is probably going to do much better than a partial responder with the IVC that's on the left that's very collapsible. Um, I try to do these volumetric analyses myself, they're fairly easy to do once you know how to use the programs. And the programs are mostly free. So I use Osirix and Horus on my Mac. 
and I use a whole bunch of uh, GNU uh, GPL libraries on my Linux box to do these renders. I do them mainly for research purposes, but I also do volumetric analysis for oncologists too. It's kind of my hobby because we don't have it available to us in Kuwait. So I do it for the guys. Um, I'll probably do a video on it at some point. But, you know, that cutoff of 15 is associated with about 2.8 liters of uh, blood products. That's about 10 units, right? So in summary, uh, your partial responder needs to declare themselves as either a responder or not. In order to predict what they're going to do, you should have a fair idea of, of the types of imaging that you can do, and you, you should be able to do them adequately. Um, in terms of the things that are clinically significant and supported by the literature, uh, contrast blush should be angioembolized early to avoid the overuse of blood products. Hemoperitoneum should be treated with caution, especially with no solid organ injury. If there is a solid organ injury, it's an independent predictor for the need for MTP and failure of non-operative management. And the use of volumetric analysis for the retroperitoneal bleeds and scoring systems that quantify retroperitoneal bleeds are also associated with the need for MTP and how much MTPs are likely. IVC collapsibility in the CT scan, even if you eyeball it, could be a clinically significant predictor of badness happening. And last but certainly not least, if your descending aorta has a cutoff of 400 or above in terms of house field units, you're probably hemoconcentrated. I would leave it at that for now because this is not RCT data. This isn't gold standard data. This is case matching retrospectively performed. Please subscribe.